Today's case is an update in one of the biggest current true crime cases out there. If you're on social media right now, it's likely that you've seen it talked about somewhere. And if you follow my channel, chances are you probably saw my first video just last week on this case, whether you saw it on my channel or if you saw it reposted from Law & Crime. But I want to talk to you guys today because we are going over all of the new details in the Chad Dorman case. There is a lot to talk about, guys. My name is Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's jump right in. This is Ten to Life with Annie Elise. Hey guys, I am so excited to introduce you to our sponsor for today's episode. Timu is a one-stop shopping platform with tons of different categories for you to shop from. From women's clothing to jewelry and even home decor and pet supplies, you can find everything you want at Timu. I've talked about them before, guys. I'm talking to you about them again because I am absolutely obsessed. At Timu, they believe that everyone should have access to high-quality products at affordable prices. That's why they offer a site-wide sale of savings up to 90% off. Yes, you heard that right, up to 90% off. This is the perfect opportunity to stock up on your favorite products without breaking the bank. Take a look at what I bought. I got these amazing new spatulas and kitchen utensils, which I am completely obsessed with and are gonna look so cute in my kitchen with the pop of red. I also got this amazing galaxy light for my kids because my son uses one right now and my daughter always wants to take it out of his room and put it into her room, but it's a projector and it shows the galaxy all up on the ceiling. It's like the perfect nightlight as well. I also got this stand, which charges my phone, my Apple Watch, everything. And I got my absolute favorite item, which is the cordless vacuum cleaner. Because as you know, life with kids is messy, life in general is messy, and I can use this in the house. I can clean up small little Cheerio spills in this tight little small areas of my car. You name it, I can take this bad boy with me anywhere and clean up all of the messes. And the best part, the original price is $37.99, but the current channel price is just $19.19. .19. That's because new users can purchase at a 49% discount by downloading Timu. But relax, because only one vacuum is allowed to be purchased per customer. And as if the savings isn't enough, Timu is also offering free shipping and free returns for up to 90 days. As a special offer to our viewers, Timu is giving you viewers $100 coupons for free, all if you download the Timu app through my link in the description or use my code PIC7824. So if you want to snag what I purchased, those items are linked in the description box below for easy reference. Don't miss out on this amazing deal and don't forget to download the Timu app and use my code for the free $100 coupons. Hurry and grab these amazing deals before they are gone. Happy shopping! As a general recap, Chad Dorman is a 32-year-old man from New Richmond, Ohio, which is a city within Clermont County. The city is a small one, and there's not a ton of crime that happens there. Chad lived with his wife Laura, his stepdaughter Alexis, and their three sons, 7-year-old Clayton, 4-year-old Hunter, and 3-year-old Chase. They all lived in a beautiful, modest home in the community. On June 15th, everything changed for that little town of New Richmond, and everything changed in the Dorman family. Officers were called to the home on Laurel Lindale Road after Chad had shot his three sons. Not only did he shoot his sons, but he also shot his wife in the hand in what seems like an attempt to keep her from saving her children. The only survivors in the family were Alexis, who was luckily unharmed, and Laura, who was shot in the hand. The details are absolutely horrifying and, quite honestly, have only gotten worse as more information has come out. The body cam footage is absolutely bone-chilling, and this case as a whole is just a nightmare. Now, if you haven't watched my first video, I was going to link it below, but unfortunately, 
I got a copyright notification from one of the local news channels because I felt it was important to include one of the interviews with a neighbor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play that video right here for you so that you can get fully caught up with all of the body cam footage and what happened in the case. If you've already seen it, just fast forward this part and then we're going to pick up with all of the new details. So let's play that now and then I'll catch you back for the new details. In the afternoon of June 15th, just a few days ago, tragedy struck within the community and within the Dorman family. A 911 call came in around 4.15 from a distressed mother screaming that her babies had been shot. The mother who called was Laura, and she was screaming about her three young boys. At the same time that she was calling in, 16-year-old Alexis was running down the street toward the firehouse, screaming her father was killing people. You can see the fire station is basically right across the street. Someone saw and heard Alexis screaming and also called 911. Very quickly, nearly every patrol car in the area was dispatched. In a dispatch feed, a dispatcher could be heard telling everyone at the firehouse to go inside. The dispatcher was also telling the ambulance to turn off sirens, likely as a way to keep the shooter unaware that the police were coming. There was also someone letting dispatch know that they had a 16-year-old in the firehouse. They were referring to Alexis. When officers got to the home, no one could prepare for the horror that they were about to witness. Three little boys shot, and their father, Chad, sitting on the porch with a rifle, with absolutely no care in the world. All three boys had been shot, and sadly, despite the efforts, the boys were pronounced dead at the scene. The body cam footage has already been released to the public. Now, I want to warn you that it is heartbreaking when you hear the boy's mother screaming in the background, and the black square that you will see in the video is censoring the little boy's bodies, who had all been shot execution style. Where's he at? Here, here. He's there. The shooter's on the porch. You get him right yeah. here. Right here. You got him on the porch. We've right asked here. not the last place we've been told. You show me your hands, Joe! Stand up and Stand walk up and walk towards us! Stand up now! Walk towards us! Stand up with your hands up! Stand up now! His name is Chad Dorman. Chad hey. Dorman. I know, but I know, but we can't. Hey. Hey. First page, and he's not complying. You know, he's a shooter. Shoot him. We gotta find cover first. We ain't no good if we ain't safe or so. <laughs> hey, hey, no. We need to come from this side where we can see him. Don't take cover behind him. We see him. We're gonna approach from this side. We got cover. Right here. Six covered. Twenty nine and sixty three attack on. Show us your Show fucking your hands, hands now. now. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up now. Stand up. Over here. Well, I, I do drugs with a clip, but I don't do drugs now. I'm sober. I'm not trying to fight you. Get 
Yatlin, say C3? Get your butt inside. Yatlin, get your butt inside. We on primary? Now. 29, we got three Main. kids down. Hey, down. 63, we're 21. Have cool. EMS respond over here. What do I do? You're clear they're being advised. Robert, 34, just start a mass cast. Do you respond? 63, do you want them to respond to the Laurel Lindale address? Where exactly do you need them? We're right in the front yard. What are you doing, man? Hey, you pretty copy all this. Can I roll over? I ain't gonna hurt you. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna hurt nobody. You got anything on you? No, I ain't got nothing, man. Phone, that's it. I ain't mad. I ain't, I ain't nothing. Just make sure that dog don't come out. I don't think he'll bite you. Just don't reach for him and try to grab him and pet him. All right. He won't bite you. What's going on, man? Nothing. Uh, can I stand up? It's kind of uncomfortable. I'm gonna get I ain't you gonna here do nothing. I ain't running away. You can do whatever you want with me. Here. You the only one else inside the house? What? You the only one else inside yeah, the house? Yeah, yeah. Sit down right uh, here. My my daughter, she ran over to the fire department. Sit down. Uh, it's my stepdaughter. Put him in the cage. This is real. Can you get the wallet out of my back pocket? Shut up, dude. You yeah, have the right to remain silent and fucking use it. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. The craziest part of the body footage was just how calm the father Chad was. I noticed that he mentioned that he was not drunk, as if that would be the concern with three murdered children in the front yard. I can't imagine the strength that it took law enforcement to stay calm with him when they were witnessing such a traumatic event that had been caused by this ever so calm man, the, their own father. During all of that, Laura was quickly rushed away to University of Cincinnati Hospital since her hand had also been shot. She wasn't made aware until later that evening that her boys were officially pronounced deceased. As more details started to unfold, the community was not prepared to hear what had happened at the hands of this horrible human being. Chad, who had been planning this apparently for months, lined his three young boys up in the front yard. While it's unclear which of the boys did this, it has been made public knowledge that one of the boys tried to run away to a nearby field. Chad then hunted him down and brought him back to the house. At some point, Laura also tried intervening and grabbed the gun. Chad then shot her in the hand. Chad then shot all three of his children execution style. Those three sweet, innocent babies were unable to protect themselves in any sort of capacity, and Chad made sure that the one other person who could protect them, their mother, was unable to do so. There were actually news reporters who were made aware of the boys' deaths before Laura even was. A reporter named Tanya from WCPO later posted that she had known the boys were deceased when she was talking about the story on the news that night. However, the detectives had asked her team not to release that information until Laura had been made aware of what happened. 
Chad's attorney requested a $75,000 bond. However, the prosecution gave more details and then asked for a bond higher than one that had ever been asked for before. And the facts I have for you at this point are as follows. The trauma that this man has inflicted on his family, the community, law enforcement, first responders, and all of the rest of us who have any idea what's going on here is unspeakable. There's been a full admission in this case, Judge. The case is still new. Uh, we're still discovering facts. But the evil horror of what we know is impossible to process. In an act of just incomprehensible cruelty, the father that stands before you lined up his three young boys and he executed them in his own home with a rifle. They were ages three, four, and seven, Judge. In an act of desperation to save her children, the mother at some point grabbed the gun the father was wielding to attempt to protect them. We know that one of the boys was able to flee into a field near the home. And again, we know from his admission, father hunted that boy down, drug him back to the property, and executed him in front of the witnesses. The mother was shot through the hand in her attempt to protect her children. Judge, I asked the court in setting this bond to just begin to imagine their fear. This was the man that every day they woke up looking to for protection, love, guidance in all things. The man they trust more than any other person on earth. The person they rely upon to keep them safe from harm. He was their world. He was their guardian. And he executed them in cold blood. We know that from his admission. By that same admission, Judge, he has committed <clears throat> one of the most monstrous, craven, cowardly acts that will ever be our misfortune to see. To make things even more disturbing, Judge, this was no haphazard act. Again, by his own admission, he planned the events of this day. This did not happen on a whim. He's confessed to what I believe is the worst crime, at least I hope, that I'll see in my lifetime. I hope it's the worst fact pattern that ever comes before this court. Judge, it's important for the court to know and the bond we're going to request today for the court to understand, Karma County deputies, Monroe Township Fire and EMS, and other first responders bravely respond to the scene where they don't know what's going on. They did not know what they're facing, and they come into a, a scene that no one can ever be prepared for. No law enforcement training, no training of any kind prepares you for this. It's easy to forget that these are men and women with families, children, feelings, emotions. They're not some automaton performing a delegated function. They're people. They were required to give CPR to gunshot children, three, four, and seven-year-old children. They held these boys in their arms, knowing, knowing there was nothing they could do to save them. How long do those scars last? What day do you wake up from that and you're healed? How do you unsee such an abomination? The bond factors this court needs to consider today are set forth in Criminal Rule 46, nature and circumstance of the crime charged, and specifically whether the defendant used or had access to a weapon, including the seriousness of the offense. It's the most serious offense that we have on the books, Judge. This is, this is it. You can't commit a more serious offense. So the nature of the crime charge is the worst crime that can be charged. Did he have access to a weapon? Yes. Obviously he did. 
The weight of the evidence against the defendant at this point, Judge, we stand here with a full admission of the defendant. That also goes to the confirmation of the defendant's identity and witnesses on scene did see at least part of what happened. Next, the court is to consider the likelihood this person would return the court if a bond were issued. Again, this is the most heinous crime with the most severe penalty under the law that we presented to the grand jury. That alone would be a, a major factor in discouraging a person from availing themselves to this court or any other. And the thought to flee and the likelihood of flight is great in the state's opinion. The danger he poses to the community is a factor that this court can consider. And I think with the facts in front of you, Judge, we can't name a person that poses a greater threat to the community. As his prior record goes, Judge, it is fairly minimal. He was charged with domestic violence in 2010. <clears throat> he is not, to my knowledge, on probation community control. Judge, the facts of this case are hopefully like no other we will ever see. When this case gets indicted in the Court of Common Pleas, I am certain that a no bond hearing will be held, and I would hope that would be granted. But at this point, at this juncture, we're going to ask this court to issue a bond we've never asked for before. I'm going to ask for a bond of $20 million. I hope I never need to request such a bond again. Thank you. Uh, date for preliminary hearing? The date for the preliminary hearing, Judge, is 6-26. The preliminary hearing will be set for June 26th at 1 p.m. At this point in time, bond's going to be set in the amount of 20 million cash or surety. Anything else at this time, Mr. Gast? No, Judge. Mr. Gallon. Mr. Gallon, anything further? Nothing at this time. All right. Thank you. Chad showed absolutely zero emotion in the front yard after brutally murdering the three children that he should have been protecting, but then decided to put on a show for the judge, which I am just disgusted by him. I'm not sure if you guys heard him talking at the end here, but it sounded like he was saying CCO2. I'm not exactly sure what that was in reference to, but there has been speculation that he was asking for the non-population community at the Claremont County Jail, essentially protective custody. After court, prosecutor Mark Tekel spoke, essentially describing the case as the worst that he had ever seen. This is by far uh, the most sickening, horrifying crime I have seen. I can only imagine that the, the, the terror that these little boys uh, felt and experienced as, as, as their, their father, the protector, was, was murdering them. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, the mother saw this. Uh, you can imagine the, the immense trauma and terror that she experienced. And we will do our utmost uh, within my office to see that uh, this defendant never sees the light of day again. Mark has worked in Claremont County for 34 years now, so saying that it's the worst he's ever seen is a really big, bold statement. He started as an assistant prosecutor in 1989. I can only imagine how much a prosecutor sees in those 34 years. So again, for this to be the worst that he's seen is just absolutely heart-wrenching. Since the court date, more details have come out regarding Chad. I searched Chad's Facebook and saw that on Monday the 12th, he had changed his profile and his cover photo. From the looks of Facebook, one would think that he is a doting dad. And it really gives me the creeps to think of what transpired just days after that. I also looked at Chad's past criminal history. Chad has a lot of motor vehicle offenses, but more seriously... He was arrested in 2010 after allegedly choking his father, Keith Dorman. The case was later dropped when Keith did not show up for court as the prosecution's witness. 
On Saturday, June 17th, Keith did an interview in which he explained that the 2010 charge was a misunderstanding and had been dropped. I'm not sure how true that is. However, I can understand if it wasn't a misunderstanding that he was possibly just trying to paint his kid in a better light. Although there is really no better light for someone who heinously just took the lives of three innocent children and in such a brutal execution manner. Keith described Chad as fun, as a loving dad. He said that he could tell Chad just snapped and that his eyes were now hollow inside. He followed that by saying, that wasn't Chad standing at the arraignment. That was not him. Keith also said that he hasn't been allowed to speak to Chad despite his wishes to, and when he asked about a motive, he said, I don't know if it was financial. I don't know if it was mental. I don't know if it was work-related. I don't know. I can't talk to him. Keith also called Chad a super father, and he said that he was not the type of person that would do something like this and that overall he was a good kid. He ended up saying that he couldn't handle it anymore before hanging up the call. I can imagine that Keith and his wife Gloria are completely shocked at what has come of Chad and what his actions have been, and I can only imagine their heartbreak and grief in this situation. However, I would still never refer to Chad as a super father. Super fathers don't hurt their kids in any sort of way, let alone kill them in such a cold, brutal, calculated way. Also, if he was planning this for months per his own admission, I don't believe that he just snapped out of nowhere. I should also mention that in court, when requesting a $75,000 bond, Chad's attorney said that Keith and Gloria were willing to co-sign his bond. A motive still has not been officially shared for what transpired at the Dorman home. There is some speculation that there may have been some issues between Laura and Chad and a possible divorce brewing, but I want to be very clear that nothing has been officially confirmed. However, in my opinion, to do something so heinous to children in front of their mother seems extremely vindictive to me. If they were in fact experiencing relationship issues, I could see it being entirely possible that he did do it to get back at her, or to just make her suffer in this grotesque sort of way. But he didn't just physically hurt her, traumatize her, or make her suffer for life. He also traumatized an innocent teenage girl who had to witness such horror happen to her siblings. The other 911 caller also did an interview. Grim day in Claremont County that started around 415 when a woman called 911 saying her babies had been shot. Around the same time, Misty Hockey was driving to Kroger and saw a teen girl running for help. She was running with a little black lab and she was screaming, call 911, call 911. She says, my uh, stepfather is shooting everyone in my household. Hockey called 911 as police rushed to the scene on Laurel Lindell Road. Um, I wanted to get her in the car, but she just refused to leave her family. And, and that just says testament of how much she loved them. Despite everyone saying it's a quiet neighborhood and everyone is very nice, one neighbor said the opposite about Chad. That 32-year-old Chad Dorman is charged with aggravated murder. He's being held without bond at the Claremont County Jail and will be arraigned in just a couple hours here in Claremont County at the Municipal Court. Then Sheriff's Office says more charges could be added. Now, the boys uh, were found shot at a home near the corner of Laurel Lindale Road and Claremontville Laurel Road. We learned that an unknown woman called 911 screaming that her babies have been shot. And just three minutes later, a separate caller who had driven by called 911 and said that they had seen an underage girl running down the road saying, quote, her father was killing everyone. Now, when the sheriff's deputies came to the house, that's when they found Dorman sitting outside on a step. They also found the three boys unresponsive in the yard with gunshot wounds. Now, we know that they did try life-saving measures until Monroe Fire and EMS arrived, but the boys did die at the scene. Now, the boy's mother, a 34-year-old woman, was also outside of the home when officials arrived. Uh, we learned that she also had a gunshot wound to the hand and was transported to UC Medical Center. Now, you guys have been hearing from a neighbor who was home at the time of the incident, and he spoke with us, and he told us uh, really what type of person Chad Dorman is and what he heard and saw from the scene. I, we heard gunshots, and 
I didn't know what it was. So I went to the store and come back, and then I, you know, found out really what happened. And unfortunately, I did see the kids laying in the yard. Yeah. Um, the guy was very unstable. Just uh, he was an unstable, unstable person. He was just very mean. He was very angry. Every day, yelling at his wife, dogging her, downgrading her, downgrading the kids. Just very angry. And if they didn't do what he said, and I've seen it firsthand. But I never thought that he would do that. There is still another neighbor who made public comments alluding to him drinking daily, yelling at his children, and even threatening to kill the neighbor's dog after he got loose. She said she has called the police on him before. Now, if that's true, it would possibly make sense as to why he did tell the police that he wasn't drunk when they came to his house. But in my opinion, he still seemed too calm to be under the influence of alcohol. Maybe something else, but I don't know. Through the heartbreak, the community is standing strong for Laura and her precious children. Outside her home, there is a memorial set up. Tons of things have been left in remembrance of three sweet little boys who lost their lives far too soon. At a nearby baseball field, a memorial was set up on the field and players had a moment of silence and prayer for the family. The new Richmond Youth Sports Association is collecting donations for the family. On Saturday night, Rachel posted a tribute to the boys. In this tribute, it reads, We want the world to know how amazing these babies were. They are not only this tragedy. They were happy and funny, so very funny, goofy, kind, loving boys. They're beautiful and deserve to be proudly displayed. They fished and played ball. They loved fiercely and with their entire hearts. They played together just as hard. Nothing will ever be right without them, but they need to be seen for the blessings they were, the happy lives they lived, the mom who loves them more than herself. They are perfect babies. The house, which was once a home of four beautiful, funny, giggling, loving children, is now a stark reminder of how horrible people can be. Throughout all of this, the one photo that got me the most was this photo of a little bike in the front yard, right nearby where those boys took their final breaths. The bike laying there is just so significant of what should be three happy little children playing outside, and now what will never be three happy little children playing outside. Okay, so now let's go over all of the new details that have come out in this case. Last week, the obituary was released, and it was the same obituary for all three of the boys, which broke my heart to read about each one of those boys. Clayton Dorman, 7 years old, Hunter Dorman, 4 years old, and Chase Dorman, 3 years old. Three brothers bonded together in life and now for eternity as God has reeled them into heaven for unending days of fishing, playing outside way past bedtime, laughing loudly, and nonstop giggling. They loved unconditionally, sharing their big hearts with anyone who they could make laugh and give them love. Clayton, fondly known as Clayton Man, loved making Lego creations, riding his go-kart, telling jokes, singing, and laughing while loving his best dog pal, Gatlin. His love language was giving gifts, whether it be finding, creating, or sharing treasures. He loved his family and often looked out for his brothers. Hunter, fondly known as Hunter Dog, loved going to the creek and catching frogs, and his love of baseball extended beyond the ball field to his bed, an attachment like an extra arm to connect him to his ball and his glove as he slept. He loved calling his mom and sister pretty girls and telling them that he loved them every day. Chase, fondly known as Chasers, loved swinging on swings and couldn't wait to be a baseball player like his brothers. He loved playing with dinos and pretending to be a superhero, he was the best cuddler, wanting his mama to stay close by to give her many hugs. He will forever be known as Mama's Baby. They are survived by their loving family. Please wear bright colors and join the family for the visitation on Monday, June 26th from 4 to 8 p.m., followed by a celebration of life service at 8 p.m. at First Baptist Church. In lieu of flowers, please send donations to the organization that provided so many happy memories for the Dorman family. 
Donations will be used to make improvements to Field 4 in their honor. You can donate, and it shows the donation for Venmo here, and you can put the field for de- and you can place field for dedication in the memo. It also shows an address that you can mail checks to if you wish to donate that way. Now we've all seen the body cam footage at this point, but I wanted to play a specific part of it again for you. Show us your Show fucking your hands, hands now. now! Stand up! Stand up! Stand up! Stand up now! Stand up! Stand the fuck up! Get your hands out of here. Tell them we're 21. Send the air. Those guys can confirm that there's people that need first aid, and that's the shooter who's not complying. They need to get care of them. I got it. Victims, they have to shoot him, they shoot him. Man, I'm trying to hurt nobody. I'm completely sober. 63, we're 21. Get the EMS over here. Well, I'll be charged with a clip, but I'm going to be charged now. I'm sober. I'm not trying to fight you. I'm trying to get you to the hospital. Get your hands out of here. Get your butt inside. Get your butt inside. We're on primary. Now. Get your butt inside. Get your butt inside. We on primary. 29, we got three clips down. Down, 63, 63, we're 21. Not Have EMS all. respond over here. What do I do? You're clear they're being advised. Robert, 34, just start a mass casualty response. 63, do you want them to respond to the Laurel Lindale address? Where exactly do you need them? We're right in the front yard. What are you doing, man? Hey, are you copying all this? Can I roll over? I ain't gonna hurt you. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna hurt nobody. You got anything on you? No, I ain't got nothing, man. Phone, that's it. I'm mad. I ain't, I ain't nothing. Just make sure that dog don't come out. I don't think he'll bite you. Just don't reach for him and try to grab him and pet him. All right. He won't bite you. What's going on, man? Nothing. Uh, can I stand up? It's kind of uncomfortable. I'm gonna get you I ain't gonna do nothing. I ain't running away. You can do whatever you want with me. Here. You the only one else inside the house? What? You the only one else inside yeah, the house? Yeah, yeah. Sit down right uh, here. My my daughter, she ran over to the fire department. Sit down. Uh, it's my stepdaughter. Put him in the cage. This is real. I still just can't wrap my mind around how calm he was after what had just transpired. We now know a couple of 911 calls were also released. Those calls show something completely different than how calm Chad was in that moment, in my opinion. The first one was from the passerby or Misty Hockey, who called 911 after Alexis told her that her stepfather was shooting everyone. 911, where's your emergency? <laughs> um, I am, I'm, uh, there's a girl uh, running down the street being like, her stepfather is killing everyone in her family. Um, it's on the corner of uh, where there's a body shop in the fire department. Do you know what road this is? Okay, what's your name? Give it into the fire department. What's your name? My, do you know what road this is? Laura Lindell Road. You said what? It's Laura Lindell Road. Okay, and what did the female say to you? And she says that her stepfather is killing everybody in her house. I did. I'm call. I'm on the phone with them right now. She say how or what was happening? I asked. Her, I asked her to get in the car with me, and she said she couldn't leave her family. But she. I think she ran to the fire department. So she went to the fire station. What did she look like? She's a. a she, she's probably a young teenager, probably like 15, uh, six, 16 maybe, with long blonde hair. Um, and they say she has a black baby? dog. Did she say anything about a baby? I, I don't know about no baby. She said she just couldn't leave her family. But I see okay. a car running around. Anything? I'm sorry? Do you see anything from the house? All I, I, well, so I drove down the road a little bit, so I was afraid that I was going to get shot myself since I interacted with her face-to-face. 
Um, so I, I'm just about like uh, maybe three houses down. Um, but she's like waiting at the corner. I don't know what she's doing, but I kind of still see her in the corner. But I saw a car kind of came around and whipped around. So I'm not exactly sure if that's him or, or, or if he's chasing her or not. I'm what, sorry. What kind of vehicle was it? Um, I, I saw it. It was like a gray. Did you see that car whip around? It's one of the fire department guys. I, 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 okay. I think maybe a fire department guy. I, it was a regular kind of focused looking gray car. Okay. We have help on the way. Thank you. Dark so gray. If you okay. Anything, All right. Else, call us back. Okay. And steer clear of the area at this time. There is another 911 clip that is from a male neighbor. Oh, are you inside where you're safe? I'm standing outside where I can see the lady. Okay. I'm, at the, I'm, a, I'm across the street at Lindale okay. Automotive. Can you tell how many people have been shot? I think two children. Okay. All right. I need, what was that your I've name, seen. Sir? My name is... What's your last name? All right. All right. We've got help on the way. If you could just try to stay inside so that you're safe. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. There has been a TikTok audio circling around with the claim that this is from Laura's call. However, it is not, and it is part of an entirely separate case. At the time of this recording, I have not been able to track down Laura's 911 call. It seems like law enforcement has not released that yet. Chad was initially charged with three counts of aggravated murder. His first court date was Friday, June 16th. He was brought into the courtroom in a green smock, which is used to keep inmates from harming themselves. The court hearing was brief, just about eight minutes. But in that court hearing, the prosecution explained what they had believed happened up to that point. The prosecution clearly explained that he is a danger to society before requesting the absolute highest bond that they have ever requested. Chad was given a bond of $20 million before returning back to the Clermont County Jail. However, on June 22nd, Chad was formally indicted by a grand jury on a slew of charges, bringing the total number of charges to 21. Nine counts of aggravated murder, eight counts of kidnapping, and four counts of felonious assault. The murder charges were obviously for the murders of the three boys. The kidnapping charges stemmed from holding everyone against their will. According to Ohio law, you can be convicted of kidnapping if you restrain someone's liberty, such as ordering them not to move when at the same time you are brandishing or possessing a knife or a gun. In Chad's case, based on the indictment documents, we now know he was using a Marlin Model HC-22 rifle. The felonious assault charges are for knowingly attempting or causing harm to people. Chad appeared in court once again on June 23rd, this time in an orange jumpsuit. During that court hearing, which was much longer than the first one, Chad was appointed two public defenders. Each charge was read off and the possible punishments for each charge was also announced. And this took a while because they went charge by charge. After the prosecution would read off a charge with the aggravating factors and possible punishments, the judge would check to make sure that the defense attorneys and chat understood before another charge would be read off. It was pretty repetitive considering he has a nine counts of aggravated murder, eight counts of kidnapping, and four counts of felonious assault. Chad pleaded not guilty to every charge. After all of the charges were read, they went to the bond section. The prosecution asked for no bond. The defense attorneys were not objecting to that, but they also didn't seem to want the prosecution to elaborate on the details of the case. Um, as the bond um, statements, yes, yes, Your Honor, um, I'll be discussing the bond. Your Honor, as the court is aware, pursuant to Article 1, Section 9 of the Ohio Constitution, this. Uh, Judge, we're not going to object to bond. We pass on bond. Uh, meaning that if he's asking further to ask for a no bond. Correct. And, and We're not opposing that. Are you comfortable with that? I'm no, glad the, the, the uh, Constitution says where proof is evident. And continue. Right. Go on, continue. Judge, I think Thank you, Your Honor. The court needs to have some understanding of the facts. What we have here is the planned slaughter of three little boys, ages seven, four, and three. Uh, the first one shot was the four-year-old shot in the house. 
two times than sustained two bullet wounds to the head, causing his death. The second child shot was a seven-year-old who fled the residence, ran some 300 feet from the residence, and was gunned down from behind by the defendant. We then approached this little boy who was injured, incapacitated, alive, and shot him in the head twice from close distance. There were power burns on the boy's head. And then he went after the three-year-old. And there was a struggle with the mother. He ripped the child from the mother's arms and put a bullet in his head. At close range, power burns on the three-year-old boy's head. Um, Your Honor, those facts uh, are important for the court to know in terms of this being a capital case. Uh, we find, Your Honor, my conclusion is, is that proof is evident and the presumption is great that he be held with, without bail. All right. Thank you. Um, the defense has nothing to add. No, you're right. All right. The court's going to order based upon Article 1 of the Ohio Constitution, Section 9, um, that's been amended on November 8th of 2022, um, that uh, the, the bond in this case be no bail at the present time. And I found it interesting that Chad was showing absolutely zero emotion in this hearing compared to the last one. Maybe he realized that putting on a show won't get him bond, or maybe reality has finally sunk in. In the last video, I had mentioned that a coroner had said that one of the boys was shot in the home. It seems like the prosecution has now confirmed that. My heart was absolutely breaking thinking about seven-year-old Clayton and the fear that he felt while trying to run away and then getting shot but initially surviving until Chad shot him twice again in the head. It seems as though law enforcement are still learning more themselves because if you remember in the first hearing, they said that Chad brought him back after running away. Now they're essentially saying that that is not what happened and that Chad ran after him and shot him while he was running. It seems like it gets worse and worse the more that we learn about this. Hearing that Chad ripped three-year-old Chase out of his mom's arms is the most awful and heart-wrenching thought that I think that I've ever heard. Because as a mother, I cannot even fathom that happening to me, trying to protect your baby and having them physically ripped away from you, knowing what's about to come. Now, I have seen a lot of people blaming Laura and saying that if they were the mom, that they would have done this, they would have done that, they would have done anything to protect their babies, that they would have put up a fight even if they were hurt and were shot in the arm. People may think that they know exactly what they would do and the steps that they would take in a situation like that, but the truth is, they don't. Unless you have faced it yourself, until someone is in that position, you don't know exactly how you would react. You don't know if you would freeze. You don't know what emotional and mental state you may be in to where your body physically shuts down, if, even if you're fighting inside to get out of it. And we still don't know all of the details of what exactly happened. And I want to also add that based on the prosecution's statement, it's clear that Laura was fighting for her children. And let's not forget that she was also injured in this tragedy when Chad decided to shoot her in the hand, which took away her ability to protect her children in that moment. Chad is facing the death penalty, which makes this case a little more tricky and a little more tight-lipped. Mark Tekelv spoke after court like he did after the last court date. I can't go into a whole lot of facts, all right, because this is a death penalty case, and my goal is to have this man executed for slaughtering these three little boys. It is an incomprehensible uh, act of horror that he perpetrated on this family. So again, that is my most important focus right now, is to ensure that they are protected and they are safe. And my hope and wish and prayer is that someday they will be able to find peace. However, the case is not sealed, and from documents obtained by a Freedom of Information Act request, one of the officers wrote in his statement that one of the boys was lying on the side yard near the porch stoop, and that another boy was lying in the side yard near the driveway entrance. In the dispatch audio, you could hear them talking about someone shooting at the firehouse multiple times. Well, documents obtained by that Freedom of Information Act request aligned with that. 
One officer wrote in his statement, Dispatch advised that the fire department stated a male was actively shooting at the firehouse. While responding, updates were provided of a male shooter who had shot three children, which were laying in the yard. Now, I do not want to go crazy with theories here, and I want to be clear that this has not been confirmed. However, we do know that his stepdaughter, Alexis, was running to the firehouse. So could Chad have been trying to shoot at her, get her down as well? It also seems that Clayton was shot at the end of the driveway after trying to run. It makes me wonder if he was trying to run with his sister to the firehouse, but he just wasn't able to get there fast enough. Again, that is not confirmed, so please do not take that as what did in fact happen. That is just speculation based on what we know from the court documents, what we know from the body cam footage, and the dispatch. Nearly two weeks later, and the community is still grappling with just such a tragic loss. And recently, the kids' coaches spoke to a news channel. And they're just devastated, you know, and they're, they're trying to heal, but that's going to be a very long process. For the two eldest boys and their older sister, these fields felt like a second home. He was like hitting. Tony Brock coached the four-year-old in T-ball. Number seven, he was, he was, uh, he was a funny kid. Um, he always liked to joke around, uh, kind of like his older brother. Uh, he would always, you know, give you dirty looks. Uh, we'd play little games messing around like his big brother. There would be times where uh, in the middle of the game, uh, in between pitches, he'd pick up a little bit of dirt and throw it at the umpire. Um, and I'd have to get on him and say, hey, pay attention. And he'd just look up and give me this little smirk. Dwayne Kuhn coached a seven-year-old for three years, number 99. I saw him uh, in the future being a pitcher, um, just his, his attitude and his tenacity um, out there on the field. Striking out his competitors like his big sister. It's really cool to watch someone that has the drive to want to continue to pitch. Carrie Lally has coached a Dorman boy's big sister for seven years. As hard as the past few days have been, the boy's sister has found the strength to return to the circle. Our last week of softball, um, we were not going to participate in the tournament, but she reached out and wants to play and um, honor her brothers. So we're making it happen and we will be playing in the tournament this weekend. I'm glad that through watching that, we can see Alexis is using sports as an outlet right now. And it really truly seems that her coach and her teammates are all doing whatever they can to be there for her during this incredibly difficult time. In another interview, Clayton's coach Dwayne discussed how kind Clayton was saying that he was with him less than a day prior, and recently, when another seven-year-old struck out, Clayton took it upon himself to encourage that boy, telling him that it's okay and that he has struck out too. Memories and stories like that of the boys, their kindness, their silliness, and just who they were as little people continue to be shared amongst the community. The community has held multiple vigils, including one at the elementary school and a more recent one at the baseball fields where the children played. At the time of this recording, the GoFundMe is just under $270,000. Rachel, Laura's sister, has announced that she will be managing the funds under Laura's direction until Laura is mentally able to handle everything on her own. The plan right now is for the money to first go to the funeral, trauma therapy, and then other things needed to help them move forward. As you may remember through what friends of the family have said, it seems that Chad was the breadwinner for the family and that Laura stayed home with the children. So without the generosity of everyone, I am sure that the stress of finances would be far more extreme. And after losing three out of four of her children, finances should be something that she doesn't ever need to stress about. It shouldn't even be on her radar. There is still no motive released to the public, and there is still a lot of speculation about the relationship between Chad and Laura. But honestly, we don't know much. We simply know that he was arrested back in 2010 after allegedly choking his father. That charge was later dropped after his father, Keith, didn't show up to the hearing as the prosecution's witness. Keith still maintains that it was just a misunderstanding and that that's why it was dropped. The only other thing that we know for sure about previous violence within the family unit was from an interview that one of the neighbors did. In another interview, that same neighbor, Richard, he described Chad as an angry man, saying there was never a day that he did not yell and that he was always yelling at Laura and treating her badly. There has also been some neighbors that have mentioned some drinking issues on Chad's end. All of that is definitely enough to assume that there were more than likely lots of issues going on prior to June 15th. 
However, I really think that in this case, it's important to try and stick to the facts and not get carried away with theories and trying to figure out the hearsay, what it means, because I know everybody's grasping for a motive and to try to understand this case, but I don't think there is an easy explanation at this point. We know that more information will for sure be coming out, so it seems best just to wait for the facts and for all of that to emerge. Chad's next court date is set for July 5th at 11 a.m. It is a pretrial hearing, so we can expect more evidence to come out about family life inside the home leading up to the incident that took place on June 15th. As always, I will be keeping an extremely close eye on this case and will be bringing you any new updates as they come out. Please continue to keep the family and friends in your thoughts and prayers as they continue to navigate this heartbreaking situation and the grief. I will keep you updated, so if you don't want to miss any of those updates, make sure you take a quick second, hit the subscribe button below. It's totally free. It'll just make sure that the new videos and updates show up on your home screen when you log into YouTube, whether on your phone or on your computer. And for real-time case updates, you can follow along on Instagram, which is at underscore Annie Elise. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in today. Please stay safe, take care of your loved ones, and I will see you during the next case. Bye.